to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, so let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. This is your house, built by your grace, not a man. We haven't come to hear that from a man or a woman. That would be like dumb, God. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Lord, that you're not only going to bless us tonight, but you're going to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ Will you bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church. We love and bless our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters at no time, Lord. Do we think of ourselves as better than them? We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And we thank you that in these churches, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is being ministered to your people. Father, we give you the praise for your wisdom. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say, Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Go with me and get your Bible. And let's talk just for a little bit. What we've been doing every time we get together on Wednesday night, whether it's me or whether it's Pastor Deborah or Pastor Dan or any of the other wonderful pastors that are on staff, Pastor Paul, we're going to hear from him, Dr. Paul. We're going to hear from Dr. Becker, whoever it might possibly be that's on staff, is bringing you a message on Wednesday night about finances, biblical finances. And the reason for it is because, my goodness, everybody, listen, You spend a lot of your time accumulating money, letting it go through you, never having enough. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And you spend a lot of your time and effort and energy in the area of finances. And what we're doing on Wednesday night is we're finding out what the Bible says about finances. Because uh, we're finding out a lot of great truths that will help you to be what God would have you to be in the economic realm. So we don't usually do this in the economic realm. We're usually talking about the spiritual realm. But we're talking about here you're on the planet. You know, God plants you here. You're here for a certain period of time and money is definitely something that you're involved in. Now you don't want to get involved in the in mammon, that is the God of this world, but you do want to understand that God's not against prospering you. And you want to see that in the scripture. In fact, I was talking to a guy the other day, and he said these words to me. I don't know, he might even be here, but I, I won't mention his name. He said, you know, I've been following you on Wednesday nights and really getting a lot out of it. But he says, I really have a problem. He says, the problem that I have is I can't really believe that God wants to prosper me. And I thought about that. For me, I don't have a problem with that. I just believe God wants to prosper me. It's kind of like when someone said to me one time, God loves you. I didn't have a problem with God loving me. You know why I didn't have a problem with God loving me? Because it wasn't about me and how lovable I am. It's about how, what a loving God he is. So he is this loving God who loves me, not because I deserve to be loved. I don't deserve to be loved. I deserve hell. And I got the concept right off the bat that uh, it's not about what I deserve. I get hell if I get what I deserve. But I get a loving, caring creator of the heavens and the earth who cares about me and cares about my future. And I realized that a lot of people, after talking to that person, that God spoke in my heart. And a lot of people that are probably in this room right now haven't got the concept of the fact that God really does want to bless them. 
wants to prosper their life. We talked about it a few months back, didn't we? we? We went to the scripture a few months back talking about how you can't go anywhere with God in the area of prosperity until you understand that God wants to bless you. But obviously, we didn't spend enough time there, so I gathered a few more verses. Some you're going to be familiar with, some that you're not going to be familiar with, because I really want to talk about how God wants to bless his people. Are you worthy to be blessed? Only because you're in Christ Jesus, you're worthy. If it's just you, yourself, your intelligence, your looks, if it's just you by yourself, you know, your abilities and, you know, your coolness, whatever, then the answer to that is, of course not. But it's not about you, it's about God. And God who loves and God who blesses, that's what God does, is a God who wants to take you to a new level economically. But until you start to believe it, it won't work. And for that young man, even though he'd heard all the principles and stuff like that, when he had made that statement to me, he was lost. He was lost in the fact because he couldn't believe because he put himself in the place of earning it instead of in the place of the grace of God bringing it to you for reasons that are found in Scripture, that God wants to bless you. Our interpretation, our translation of the word blessing is, blessing is simply the power to succeed are the power to prosper. In other words, God gives you the power to succeed in your marriage, that's a blessing. With your children, that's a blessing. With your finances, dreams, vision, with your destiny, with your, you know, your family, relatives, even that, if you believe that, that's a miracle. But God gives you the power to succeed in every area of your life because he's the God who wants to bless you. And as soon as you get that concept down, it really helps you because you're never going to believe God for finances if you, first of all, don't really believe that God wants to bless you. He gives you the power to succeed. Where you never had the power before, you got Jesus Christ, and now you got the power to succeed. You never had anything but lost. You were being a puppet to the devil. The Bible says the devil was your father. My goodness, you were like a a pawn that he knocked around the board and he used and he did what he wanted to and told you what to do and how to do it. And and, and you didn't have any kind, you never had any real power to succeed at all. Then all of a sudden you get washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, brought into his family. You got a new family now. You're out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And now God really wants to do something with you, your children, your finances, dream, destiny, future, blessings in every area of your life. And until you start to see yourself as one who not because of who you are, but because of who he is, worthy to receive because of who he is, and it's his will. So someone might say to me, well, Pastor Jim, if that's all true, then why doesn't he just bless me? There's a lot of conditions involved with this. Like, for an example, the heart, integrity, growth, maturity. Being able to handle the blessings like we've talked about before. God won't bless you if you can't handle the blessings and the blessings turned out to handle you. If the blessings handle you instead of you handling the blessings, you're a mess. And God's not going to put something in your life that's going to make you a mess. And that's where most people are at right now. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between obedience uh, that's delayed and instant obedience. Are you following me? There's some people that are instantly obedient. And there's some people that are delayed. Eventually, you'll get around to being obedient. But him and ha, big difference with God. Big difference in maturity level. Big difference in whether or not the God who wants to prosper you will prosper you. So there's a lot of conditions you and I are learning about. But the one thing that you've got to get that started off right is the fact that God wants to prosper. Because without that, it doesn't work. And then you just sit there and say, well, I listen, but I, I really don't believe it. I really see myself as a loser. I see myself as a failure. My parents said I was a failure. My brother, siblings, they said I was a failure. I, you know, I went to work with people. They said I was a failure. They fired me on my job. I went to school. The school told me I was a failure. You know, I've, oh, I got married to somebody who made promises to me. They called me names and left me with a bunch of kids or whatever, vice versa, it might possibly be. And I just see myself as a big failure. I'm really not worthy to prosper. Can I tell you something? You aren't, but God wants still to prosper you. 
And you'll never go into the realm of God's prosperity until you start believing that God wants to do it. Whether he's going to do it today or tomorrow, whenever it is that the conditions are right so that you can handle it, that's the question. A lot of times we don't see that. So why God wants to prosper you tonight? Four things. You know I'm the one, two, three, four guy? When you come here, it's just simple. And it's simple. Here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four points. Hopefully you get one of them. If you get one of them, that's better than when you came in and had none of them. Now, let me just say this about this. This is kind of funny. Why God wants to prosper you. We could probably give you 30 points. Why give you 30 if you can't handle it? Three is usually as many as anybody can handle, but I'm going to give you four because I believe the best of you and hope that you get one. Is that all right? Because 90% of you didn't even bring your Bible. I'm not going to get on that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say what I think of people who come to church without their Bible. Other than the fact that God wants to bless you too. It's just going to take a little longer. (laughs) Why God wants to prosper you. Here's number one. We are his children. Can you imagine such a simple statement like that? I don't know about you, but parents that are healthy want their children to prosper. Maybe some of you had bad parents or weren't very healthy. They only cared about themselves, and I'm sorry about that, but you got a new parent in heaven. And he doesn't take Prozac every night or shoot up or snort something or smoke it. You know what I'm talking about. You know, he's not interested in himself. He's interested in you. And you are, when you get born of the Spirit of God, you are his child. I didn't say you look like it or act like it. I didn't even say some of you smell like it. But you are his child. And like any good, healthy parent, The parents actually care more about the children than they do themselves. I don't know very many healthy parents that if their kids are suffering in an area, they wouldn't instantaneously take that pain on themselves. Then the kids not have it. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the Father sent him to do? Broke the son from the side and so go and take the pain and the sin of mankind on, because he loved us. Can you imagine such a thing as that? We're his children. And if we really are his children, and we know how as earthly parents that are somewhat healthy to give to our children, then why wouldn't it be a concept in our minds that the heavenly Father, who is perfectly structured, would even give to us greater than we could ever give to our children? I mean, if you stop and think about what he's already given us because we're his children. He didn't send gold, diamond. He didn't send a universe. He didn't send silver. He didn't send rubies. He didn't send a bag of uh, wealth the size of the Hawaiian Islands to pay the price for you. He came himself. The highest price that God could pay for mankind is himself which makes you the most valuable people on the planet to God. Because the price of you is determined by the cost someone paid for you. And he pays this ultimate price. Not 50 bucks, 100 bucks, gold, silver, or anything the world has to offer, but himself, the creator of the heavens and the earth, comes and gets nailed on that cross and raises from the dead in the third day because you are the most valuable commodity to him on the planet. You're his kids. My goodness sakes alive. We don't oftentimes see ourselves that way, but we should. I've already turned there. Maybe you would like to. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Verse number nine says it like this. And Jesus is speaking and he makes this comment. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asked for bread, he'd give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know. In other words, if you don't have the concept that God has, God is all good. 
We are trained in evil. First thing comes out of our mouth is no. First thing is rebellion right off the bat. I mean, if you've, if you've got a little child, don't you ever wonder, where in the world did they learn to be so nasty at times? First thing that comes out of their mouth is no, 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 no. Ah, don't do that. They do it anyway. We are trained well in evil. And he says, you being who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So all of a sudden now he opens the door that we ask. He says, you have not because you what? Ask not. Asking God the Father for something is really cool because what you're doing is you're really saying, I I need you to supply it for me, and I believe you can. And that's a statement you're making when you ask. So asking is not a bad thing. You ought to ask about everything. In Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse number 22, let's just pop it up on the overhead. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Wait a minute. If a good man, the, the good man there is a, another translation of the Bible, remember Jesus, we'll read it in just a few moments. The guy comes up to Jesus and said, good master. He says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. So the only translation for the word good up there is the word God. So he says, a good man or a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Some of you are going to have a real problem fulfilling that one until you start getting on faith and start believing God. Open some supernatural doors for you. Start realizing you're a king's kid and you got favor. God will open doors that no man can open, close doors no man can close, that's his promise. Then what in the heck are we doing not just sitting here and saying, well, I've heard that before, but I really don't believe it about myself. You have the favor of God. Because you're his kids according to that. And he says he leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Not just to his children, but he's got enough to leave to his children and his children's children. That's a big inheritance. And he says, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Well, wait a minute. That means something too, doesn't it? Doesn't that mean that all the stuff out there that the world has is really eventually going to end up back in your arms and hands and mine too because of the inheritance that we have. Jesus is going to leave us something. He says these words, we're heirs and Romans 8 chapter, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. In other words, what Jesus gets, we get. Why? Because we're kids. We ought to see ourselves every day that way instead of down and out, can't make it and fools. They act like fools all the time instead of doing what God would have for us. We ought to see ourselves. The reason God wants to prosper is because we're his kids. The second reason why God wants to prosper you is this. Prosperity is meant to free us from the cares of things. It is very normal for you to care for things. It's not a bad thing. You know, Jesus didn't go about and say, well, you know what, I'm hungry, I guess I won't eat because I really don't care. He said, what have you got? Your little boy's lunch, he blessed it. You know, and when he needed something, I mean, he, he obviously had some wealth because Judas Iscariot was his, uh, his uh, man that was his accountant that followed him. And remember when there was a, 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 a girl that came and gave some perfume to to a very expensive perfume uh, to Jesus and and, uh, poured it on his feet and on his hair. Judas Iscariot got really angry. Remember that? And remember what Judas Iscariot said? Remember, he was a thief. And he had control of Jesus' money. So Jesus wasn't freaking out about it. You think Jesus knew he was a thief? (laughs) Of course he knew he's a thief. He said, then why did he put him in that place of being a thief? Because he's not hung up over money. It's a replenishable resource. And by the way, you don't have an accountant going with you 
managing the finances unless you have some finances. So obviously must have had something. Judas Iscariot makes this statement, you ought to take that. What are you doing wasting that oil? Let's take it and sell it. And then he says, give to the poor. Very next line. Do you ever thought about what the next line? It wasn't, and it says these words. He didn't say that because he cared about the poor. He said that because while it's sold and the money goes in the bag, he gets to steal. (laughs) She's not hanging up over. He don't have a problem at all. He didn't care about those people. He just wanted it sold to have the money come back in the treasury where he get to watch over it, and then he rips off the top. Is that cool? Interesting understanding. So oftentimes we see things, you know. God wants to deliver us from things. Jesus is so free, he's delivered from the things. A lot of us that are in here, we still have things running us instead of us running the things. And the purpose of prosperity is to deliver you from the things, not just to get the things to you. When you start thinking prosperity just gets things to you instead of the deliverance from the things, you've missed the purpose of prosperity. You need to hear that again, don't you? Want me to say it again? I don't know if I can. (laughs) The point being here is this, this is something for us to see. There's an interesting truth that's coming forth There are two types of caring. We're supposed to be delivered from the cares of things. There's two types of cares. There's the cares you have when you don't have enough money. And there's the cares you have when you have too much money. And there's two kinds of cares that you're going to have to deal with that God's going to give you. One is when you don't have enough money, and the other kind of care you have is when you have too much money. And both of them in themselves are traps to your heart. Are you following me? When you don't have enough, then you work overtime and a lot trying to get it, and your time with God becomes little. And when you have too much, you work and manage to try to keep it all together and try to hold it all together and manage it properly and steward it. I talked to a rich man one time. He said, I've worked twice as hard trying to keep what I earned. And either one of them are wrong. There's got to be a balance. And the balance can only be found in each one of us is different. Did you know that? Because it's not about the things, it's about the heart. I want to say this to you, and I'm going to just let you know what I'm speaking by giving you a point. Anytime that your effort becomes deeper than your relationship with your God, you are now out of order. That's supposed to be on the overhead, but they missed it. Which means I have to say it again. Anytime that your effort becomes deeper than your relationship with God, you're now out of order. I didn't say more intense. I didn't say more effort. You know, sometimes you'll hear this. If you put more effort in and working, trying to get money, then therefore you're, you, you will always put more effort into trying to accumulate something than you are in your relationship with God. But it's not deeper than your relationship with God. I work harder at my job than I do at spending time with God. That's understandable by God. But I never work deeper. Are you following me? And you will always work harder for something, but never can it be deeper for something. And when your cares for having too little are more and deeper than your, or cares for having too much are deeper than your relationship with God, you are now out of order. (laughs) Is anybody listening? Because listen, it was caused to bring you to a place where you are free from the cares of stuff. Let me read it to you one more time 
while the back room tries to find it so they can type it out the right way. Anytime that your effort becomes deeper than your relationship with God, you're now out of order. I didn't say any time that you work harder or longer. I said deeper. Are you following me? In Mark, the 10th chapter, you're there in Matthew. Just go back with me to Mark in the 10th chapter, and let's take a look at this. You've read the story before, but I, I want to read it to you, and let's look at it from a little different perspective this time. In fact, we've read it a couple of times because it's such a good story. In verse number 17, it says this, and Jesus is speaking in a few moments, and let's hear what he has to say. And now, as he was going out on the road, one came running knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? See the words good teacher up there? Jesus challenges him. You'll see it in the next verse. Why do you call me good? And the reason for that is because good meant I will follow you because you're right with God. That's what it meant, that word good. In other words, he was making a statement. You're a teacher and I will follow you because you're a teacher of the good things. And when Jesus hears this statement, he comes along in verse number 17 and he, and he says these words. He says in verse number 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. And he says this in verse number 19, Jesus goes on and he says, and you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witnesses, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered, he said to him, teacher, all of these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. And said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor that you will have treasure in heaven. We're going to be talking about treasure in heaven not too long from now. And come and take up your cross and follow me. Verse 22, and here's my point. But he was sad at the word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Hey, he had cares that are deeper for the things he had than for the good teacher. Is that, are you listening to that? He had cares for the things that he had that were deeper than for the good teacher that he was supposed to follow. And that can happen to every one of us. The purpose of prosperity is not just to add to your life. The purpose of prosperity is to get you to the place where you don't give a flip about the stuff of this world and your whole vision is about the things of the Lord and you use the things of the world for whatever season you have them, but you move on in Jesus afterwards. We're talking about a wonderful subject. The subject is... Why God wants to prosper you, number one, because we're his children. Number two, his prosperity is meant to free us from the cares of things. But number three is really cool. I like number three, to be generous to others. I mean, God called you to be a blessing to others. And in order for you to be a blessing to others, you cannot be a blessing to others until you are blessed. I want you to hear that again. You cannot. Is, does God want you to bless others? Does God want you to be generous to others? Does God want you to give over and above to others? Does God want you to help those that are down and out and poor? Does God want you to do these things? The answer to that is of course he does. But how can it happen? And it never will happen until you realize that your father in heaven wants to bless you or gives you the ability to prosper. Because that's what this is all about. He wants us to be generous to others. And the purpose of prosperity is not just that it stops with me and I gain in life and I'm so cool and I've got all the stuff. The purpose of prosperity is that I would have an abundance so that I could give to others and I not even feel it. Because I don't have a care for that. I have a care for him that's more than that. And until we get this in our hearts, it never really works. Because we're always thinking prosperity is here for me. Yes, you will benefit from it. 
Yes, you will prosper in your home and your cars and the way of living and society and social systems and standards and things like that. And that's fine because God doesn't care about that. But he is making you generous, so that, prosperous so you can be generous to others. Because it's in the generosity of others that God gets involved. I can't tell you how many pastors all over the world. I'm going to go speak to 2,500 pastors. I, I think someone said that to me uh, next year. I'm not quite sure. Not uh, in, in uh, Australia. And uh, I, as I understand it, one of the things you, you, I, I, all over the world, they ask me, why do you feed people at the rock? Well, we feed people because people have a need. We need to be generous. Then their question, inevitably the next question, do they come to the church? And I say, no, very few of them come to the church. Then why do you feed them? I said, I feed them because God comes to the church. That's what this is all about. This is all about being generous to others. And when you're generous to others, God gets involved in your life. Oh, but the problem, here's the catch 22. You can't be generous to others if you don't have anything. Yeah. 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 How many of you have said this? Well, God, just give it to me. I'll, I'll pass it on. Well, God says, okay, here's five bucks. Let's see what you do with it. <laughs> Man, let's go do this in an outburger thing. Man, I got five. Remember, if you can't handle the little things, you're never going to get the big things. That was one of the principles we've talked about. So God's looking for us. Remember, let me just read something to you. I'm going to put it up on the overhead. Remember um, uh, 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. In fact, you know it by heart. Did you know that you know it by heart? You know it by heart. If you go to this church, you know this verse by heart. But let's go, instead of verse number 8, let's go to verse number 7. Just pop it up on the overhead. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Now, if you don't have a heart that's generous, you won't give anything. And you'll never be instantaneously obedient, and you will delay in your obedience, which is just as bad as being disobedient. Um, we'll share that somewhere down the road. So let each one of you, as he purposes in his heart. I didn't see wallet. I didn't see checking account. I didn't see as he purposes in his checking account. In other words, some people add it all up. I've got extra this month. I'll give it. That's cool. But you'd been better off giving it before you added it up to see what you have. Not that you're a fool and you shouldn't keep track and be a good steward and manage properly because you don't want to bounce checks. But still at the same time, first things first, and that's God. And he says, so let anyone you give it a purpose in his heart. Not grudgingly or out of necessity. Grudgingly means I hate giving. Out of necessity means some big mouth preacher talked you into giving. And the whole country is, is swayed by big mouth preachers that talk people into doing this. And let me tell you something, it's not what you do, it's how it comes out of your heart. It's not the amount, it's the heart. And when the heart's in it, man, the amount, remember, you're, you're free of that care. And, uh, and, and you're, now you're learning how to be a generous person. And well, I'm here to be generous to somebody else, not just to attain for myself. I'm here living not only that I would live for my family and my wife and my children, but I'm here because I am building up something inside of me, a character of God that comes and gives to others. That's what this is all about. He says, for God loves a crappy giver. Does your Bible say that? It doesn't say that at all. God loves a complainer. See, it's all about your heart. And it's all about this simple, simple word called generosity. Which is something that, well, I met Debbie, she was a stingy. And, and uh, so now she gives everything away. But when I met her, she was so stingy. I mean, she had nothing away. She, I, ha I bought her a, 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 a brand new Cadillac. 
Well, it was brand new to her. It was about 100 years old. It only, it only, you know, it only worked two weeks and blew up. But then we gave it away. In fact, she had a car that didn't have any brakes when I met her. She'd go down, you know, anybody remember when you were young, didn't have brakes, how you pumped? Does, that, does anybody remember pumping? Wave at me if you ever had to pump your brakes. So all of you know you've been in the same kind of car Debbie had. You probably had a first, she probably gave it to you. She'd pump her brakes. I said, you can't have that brake. So I went out and bought her a Cadillac. I admit the Cadillac was 100 years old and blew up. But, and she got mad at me for giving her car away. But I got her old car and gave it away to somebody. They fixed it up and drove it forever. It ran great. Her Cadillac were, fell apart. But the, the car, she always liked that old car. Today, she's one of the biggest givers I know. You can hardly wait to give. Generous, she loves, she's a cheerful giver. Loves to give, bugs me. I like to have some material things once in a while. I like nice things. That's okay. But Deborah loves to give. She lives to give. Cheerful giver. Now, the verse you know is the next verse. Verse 8 says this. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things and may have an abundance. Generosity was what we're talking about. It may have an abundance. Generosity is what we're talking about. You, you may have an abundance. That you may have an abundance. And abundance means just not getting by. You've got to be blessed to be a blessing. Are you hearing me? That's what the Word of God says. This is the heart of God. This is what God wants to do for you. Not because you're so cool, but because He's great. And He says that you may have an abundance for every godly work. Is that cool? Generosity. The last one, I'm just going to go quickly through this. We're talking about why God wants to prosper us. We're his children, number one. Number two, prosperity wants to, is meant to free you from the cares of things. So if things have in you, you're free from that. Generous to others, number three. Number four, to fund the gospel. And God wants you prosperous so that you can spread the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, Period. In fact, it says this, we've read it, I don't remember if it was Pastor Dan or Pastor Deborah, one of them just was there, Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. Go, just pop it up on the overhead. And then he says, you know, you're going to complain in your heart about how you made the money yourself instead of God gave it to you. Then he says, in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gained me this wealth. God says, that's not the way it is at all. I gave it to you. Watch this, verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he, Notice the capital H in the word he, meaning God, who gives you power to get wealth. Last part of that verse, come on. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to his fathers as it is this day. In other words, God's interested in establishing the promises of God and the heart of men so that men don't have to die and go to hell, but men can get right with God and go to heaven. I tell you what, he loves us here are kids. Tonight, it's just a simple thing. Simple message. A simple message that God wants to prosper you. You may look at your checkbook and say, why isn't it happening? Because maybe you're not doing your part. Or maybe you're not into your part. Or maybe you don't believe it. Or maybe you just can't see yourself as somebody God wants to prosper. And I can't do anything about that. But the scripture is very clear. Number one, that God wants to prosper you because you're his children. Number two, God wants to prosper you to free you from the things that used to have you. Number three, God wants to prosper you so you be generous to others. Number four, God wants to prosper you so that you will fund the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the planet. And I tell you what, there's probably not anybody in here that wouldn't love to fund the gospel and be part of making sure the gospel goes out all over the planet. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. See you do that. Just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. So let's just talk just for a moment. Some of you, and I said these words, you're a child of God. Some of you aren't a child of God. No, you're going to die, and you're going to go to hell, and somebody needs to tell you that's what it's going to be like.
unless you change your future. So listen to me. You can't get to heaven because you're good. You don't get to go to heaven because you're nice. You don't get to go to heaven because you say you love God. You don't get to heaven because you go to church or join the church. You don't get to go to heaven because your mommy and daddy told you you were a Christian when you were a kid, had you christened or baptized as a baby, put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. You get to go to heaven because you get there Jesus' way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You can't make it any other way. That means you can't get there my way or your way. You can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. If you're going to get to heaven, you don't get to heaven because you fit comfortably in the social systems or economically make it or your intelligent levels above everybody else. You get to heaven because you get there Jesus' way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He says you must be born again. That's what Jesus said. You must, I didn't say it, Jesus said it. You must be born again. Now most people when they hear the words born again, they get really nervous or they don't like it because Hollywood movies, television, stories have made born again people look like real trashy idiots, fools and foolish. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again means this from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Let me tell you what it means so you know exactly what you need to do to get right with God instead of going to hell. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Now listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be. I always say it like this, God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down, but it's all or nothing, and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. What did he just really say? People that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, even though they call themselves Christians. That's what he really just said. You can call yourself a Christian, doesn't make you a Christian. Not what you call yourself that makes you that. You can go down to the ocean and sit in the water down there at the beach for four months and call yourself a fish. You're nothing but a slimy human when you get out. You'll never be a fish. So you can call yourself whatever you want. You're not going to make it. The bottom line is in order for you to get to heaven, you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Now, I want you to hear me. I emphasize the word give. Because listen to me. He's not going to make you do it. It's your call. He's not going to hit you in the head with a two by four. He's not a conniver. He's not going to break into your life to steal your heart and emotions. It's your call, your choice to whether or not you give God all of your heart or whether or not you give God all of your life. Your call. I can't make you do it. person next to you can't make you do it. A woman one time caught her husband cheating. She said to her husband, you go to church with me and get saved, I won't leave you. The guy comes to church. She nudges him and says, this is the time you get saved. He says, okay, I'll get saved. It's easier to get saved, supposedly, than to lose his family, his house, his money, in a divorce. Trust me, the guy's not saved. Wrong reasons. No one can make you do this. It's got to be from the heart. That's what this is all about. And here we are in a safe, friendly place. We have sung, we have laughed. Some of you have gotten on your knees already, wept before the Lord. Some of you are going to walk out of this place tonight hoping that you got healed, and you're going to see they're getting better every day, stronger and healed because of what took place tonight on your knees. Tonight is your night of salvation. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, hey, come on, I'm speaking to you. Be honest with yourself. If you're one of those people that are saying, I wonder if I have, well, at least make sure that you have. Get right with God. 
Tonight is your night. Maybe you've known him in your mind all of your life. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. I understand that. We all know who Jesus is, but it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. You've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three and go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You put it right back down. Is that okay? What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. There's hands already back in the family room going up all over the place. Just wait a minute. We'll do it all at the same time. Here's what I'm asking you. Tonight, if that's you, you know you need to get right with God. You could sit there and do nothing, but Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. I'll confess you as mine before my Father. Then the day comes you stand before God. Jesus will speak on your behalf. Or you can sit there and do nothing, and he'll do nothing when you stand before the Father someday. It's your call, your choice. But it's going to mean you stick your hand up and let me see it in a moment. You say, wait a minute, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed, Pastor Jim. Uh huh. You might be, but it's better to be embarrassed for a moment in the house of God than to be in hell forever and ever because you're more concerned about what people think around you instead of what God sees about you. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, I know this family room's already ready to go, but all across this place is your time to get your hand up and get right with God, giving him all of your heart, giving him all of your life, being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. I'm counting to three. Who should raise their hand? You should raise your hand if you're not sure about where you're at with God. Or if you've been running from God instead of to God. If you're one of those people, maybe you've never given him all of your heart, you know that. Maybe you've never given him all of your life, and you know it. Tonight tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Here it is. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's two. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's three. God bless you. There's four. Thank you. There's five. There's six. There's seven. There's eight. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's eight wise people already. Anybody else? Real quick. You didn't get your hand up, but you know you should have. Come on now. Come on. There's eight wise people. Where are you? Nine? Nine? You know you need to get your hand up. Get it up. Let's see it. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? I'll just go over this audience one more time. There's eight wise people. Where are you? Number nine. You know you need to get your hand up. Just get it up. Anybody else? Thank you, number nine. Where are you? Number ten. You know you need to get your hand up. Just get your hand up. Thank you, number 10. God bless you. You know you need to get your hand up. Where are you, 11? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 10 of you. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Hey, remember when I said God wants to prosper you because you're his children, you're his child? This is how you become a child of God. You get born again. So there's 10 wise people, but I know there's 11, 12, 13, and 14. You need to get out of yourself and get into God. Get your stuff, bring a friend, and come up here, even if you didn't raise your hand. All 10 of you that did raise your hand, I want you to get a hold of your friend or a coat, purse, sweater, Bible, whatever it is you came with, you get your stuff. You said you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Meet me right here in front. But number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you get out of your seat, bring somebody if you need to, and get up here too right now. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come on now, come on, you come up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. No matter the way I walk, it's a mercy. Come on, you come too, hurry. Come on, you come too, hurry. Thank God you guys have come. Over here 
is Pastor Dave. He's waving at you right now. He's really a good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? And then second, he's going to give you some free information, some free stuff to take home and read about now that you're a Christian, what to do next. And then he's going to tell you about a program we have that will help you get strong, healthy, and a, be a strong Christian. Why? So, because we don't want you to go back and fall through the cracks. We want you to go on with Jesus and be blessed. So let us help you, okay? Because you said you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.